Before I introduce my guest, uh, the poem, the part of the poem, the beginning of it that we just heard, uh, is called How Many Buddhas Can They Destroy? No, it wasn't written right after Bamiyan Buddha. It was something that we will talk about and he will let us know. Uh, before I go further, let me just introduce him. Kaiser Huck is our guest this morning. He comes from our neighboring country, Bangladesh. And uh, he is a Mukti Jodha, which literally, literally means a liberation fighter. He is a war veteran of 1971 Bangladesh war. And he leaves, breathes literature. He's a poet, he's a translator. Uh, there are too many awards, too many fellowships, and he's a professor, he's a lecturer. He cultivates mind, he moderates mind, he teaches them to be in literature and learn the essence of it. Let me call him on dais, Mr. Kaiser Huck. Can we please have a round of applause? My first question to you, sir. What prompted you to write that book, that poem? This was uh, some years back. Um, you know, the use of Facebook to incite violence, this has become very common. Um, we've seen this in Burma, in Myanmar, we've seen this in Bangladesh, and I'm sure it happens elsewhere as well. So um, one a Facebook account was hacked, and people, and the rumor went around that this guy had something that hurt the religious sentiment of the majority. And so a lot of uh, Buddhist um, uh, uh, the pagodas and houses were ransacked. Mercifully, no one was ki uh, killed, but it was a big shock. And I felt I had to respond to that. And this, was, this poem was my response. Um, so even though it was prompted by a particular incident, I think it has uh, um, universal uh, significance because uh, um, it applies not only to a situation where Buddhists are attacked, but any community when it is targeted. So the same thing has happened across the border in Myanmar, um, and it's been going on throughout the world. You see. So, and the uh, poem ends by saying that there's a Buddha in all of us, which, and the Buddha tells us that this is uh, not right. Um, but when uh, we do not listen to the Buddha within us. You see. We have the kind of violence and the horrible things that go on in the world today. So that is the... See, uh, you were a Mukti Jodha yourself, a liberation war fighter, veteran. So did that affect you, your writing, your literature? And tell us about your experience. Um, it didn't I, I didn't write How old much. were you? I was uh, 20. I was a second year undergraduate. So, and then I came, as soon as the war was over, I went back to my studies. Um, to me, it was an existential choice. I mean, we were in a situation where, I mean, I, I could try to lie low or get out of the country, as a few friends did or resist. And so, um, like many, I decided to join the resistance. And uh, I think if I hadn't, my conscience would have bothered me. You know. um, so I, I was, I didn't belong to any political party at that time. But it was, um, I mean, history um, makes Call us the history? face hmm? certain situations where you have to choose. You know? So that was one, a crucial one. Yeah. Um, this also brings me to the question that Bangladesh Liberation War is one country which where it, in the history of modern uh, world which is born because of, on the basis of the language, that is Bangla language. Mm -hmm. See, so the language that is so prominent, the reason why the country is born, you do not write in that. How do you explain that? <laughs> language is a very tricky thing. <laughs> well, um, the language movement that you mentioned, that took place after the partition. You see, What happened is that 
<clears throat> the Pakistani establishment wanted to impose Urdu as the state language. Now, Urdu is uh, actually the mother tongue of just a small percentage of people in what was Pakistan. Um, so it was a totally misguided you see, um, decision. The, in what was East Bengal, um, people resisted. And they told Jinnah that you know, we will not accept this. And so the students went on strike, they agitated, and five were killed by the police. That is the so origin. But alongside, you see, there was also an economic disparity between the two wings of Pakistan. So the two things were inter intertwined, you know, the economic uh, resentment and the question of language. And when the, the independence war took place, so the language movement was seen as a kind of, as, an, as a big landmark that uh, in the way, in the shaping of our national identity. Um, now, after the, you see, before, before 71, I went to a kindergarten school. I was educated entirely in English, which is why English became my literary language. After we became independent, the English medium system was scrapped. So uh, that it used to be uh, English medium, but following the national curriculum, which you also have, I'm sure. That was scrapped, and the vacuum has been filled by new English medium schools, which prepare students for the IGCSE, and a few for the IB. The result is that um, this, the new generation of upper middle class children are more alienated from the uh, native culture than we were. Because even though we were taught entirely in English, it was the same the national curriculum and we were at home in both actually. Um, and which is why I have done a fair bit of translation from Bangla into English. So it's like, um, instead of writing in Bangla, I, I have translated from Bangla into English. Now, after the independence, after independence, um, the uh, again the question of Bangla as our as the uh, essence of our national identity that was, um, you know, uh, highlighted. But in the process, the language and culture of many small ethnic groups was sidelined. And then Bangladesh succeeded in having the U U UNESCO recognize the 21st of February, which is when the mm. students were killed, as International Mother Language Day. And so now, so that has brought the marginalized languages into the scene. So uh, we have to now, uh, there are about 38 languages according to one count. And all of them, each, in each of these language communities, you have a cosmogony, um, you know, a, a, a mythology, uh, folk tales, fairy tales, and some contemporary writing as well. So. Uh, they, those two are now, I mean, have to be recognized as part of the uh, linguistic um, mosaic of Bangladesh. So even though the vast majority speak Bangla, we have these languages. Um, we have even a few uh, Urdu speakers, a, a small number of Urdu speakers, because in old Dhaka, the, uh, peop the original inhabitants of old Dhaka um, speak a kind of Urdu. See? They demotic, speak Urdu. Uh, demotic Urdu. Because they went with the, as uh, camp followers of the Mughals mm. and settled there. And even now you can hear this demotic Urdu in old Dhaka. Plus there were those who were stranded, you know, who uh, claimed they are their, their Pakistanis and then now they have, uh, you know, accepted Bangladesh. So they have, they also speak Urdu. And there's a small, uh, even a small Urdu literary circle. They mm. publish you know, magazines and things. So, I mean, yes, Bangla is the language of uh, 
the, the uh, more than 95%, you know, almost 100%. But we also have these other languages. And English as a literary language is now becoming more important. And that is because of uh, growing transnationality. So there are lots of Bangladeshis who have uh, been educated in the West, who have settled in the West, and then many have come back. So the number of... Uh, That's how we get Brickland. Yes, exactly. Or Babu Bangladesh. Or Babu Bangladesh. And then many of the young writers who are now appearing, I mean, every year you have a few, um, are products of the um, r r writing programs <laughs> in Western But it did take off pretty late uh, because uh, Bengal was the capital, had mm. Calcutta or now as Kolkata uh, as the capital of colonial India. So the both sides of Bengal, uh, be it on this side of the Padma Padda or th that side of the Padda, both of them had a flourishing English language culture. But when the partition happened between that post partition and till about the first uh, 50 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, we hardly had anything uh, really good Bangladeshi writers, prominent, popular, mm -hmm. coming out, mm -hmm. writing in English. In the no, we don't. I mean, in fact, the uh, mm -hmm. earliest uh, significant work in English is a short story by Begum Rokia. Hmm. called, you know, uh, Sultana's Dream, which was published in 1905 in a magazine in Madras, and you can get it online. It's a wonderful feminist story, and uh, it um, you know, envisages a feminist utopia where men are, you know, treated the way women are in patriarchal society. So it's a marvelous, you know, um, feminist fantasy. And then in 1945, recently I wrote the article, the essay on Bangladesh for the Oxford History of the Novel in English. And I found out that in 1945, Humayun Kabir, mm. who um, he uh, published a novel in English, Men and Rivers. And then before 71, there's just one or two. After 71, it started slowly, you see. Um, you had uh, in the 90s, and then mainly in the, in this century, yes, you have a post big, 2000 and yeah. this so in this in the 60s before 71, I was writing poetry. One of my teachers, she published uh, two volumes. A friend of but mine, but they were never popular. It was uh, no um, the the in, uh, these literary supplements of English language newspapers would have some things, you know, um, belletristic pieces. But uh, very few books were published, or very few books that would uh, be um, considered worth, you know, consideration from a literary point of view. So um, why? Again, I mean, you see, when you, you mentioned Bengal as being one, there is a difference because the Bengali Muslims came late to Western education. Mm. You see, so the uh, Bengali Muslims had n nothing to do with the Bengal Renaissance. Mm. If you look at the great figures of the Bengal Renaissance, they were, uh, you don't find a single Muslim. Nope. It's only towards the end of the 19th century that you have one or two, like Mir Musharraf Hussain and a few others. And then, uh, so it, uh, it's only in the 20th century that after they started going to uh, the Western style schools, which the British introduced, and then the university. So it, it picked up slowly. No, um, and uh, now I think uh, it, it, uh, it, it has been accepted um, uh, de facto, as it were. But uh, even then, you know, um, there's no um, official prize for writing in English. In, you had a similar situation in India in the 60s when the Angrezi Hatao movement was yes, going on. Yes. Yes. And then the. Uh, I think you, the, your parliament must have passed a, uh, an act and accepting English, and the Sahitya Academy introduced a prize for writing in English. That, I think, was decisive. It was a great, you know, that, great that, encouragement. That, that kind of thing hap uh, plays a big role. I've been arguing that um, 
uh, Bangladesh should recognize English as the official second language. Because that kind of recognition me would mean that no, no one should, uh, would feel ashamed of using English, you know, because there's a kind of stigma attached to it, you know. Oh, in Bangladesh, not, no, not, because yeah. of Bangla being exactly. such a... Exactly. You're not writing in your mother tongue. You are not, you're alien, you see, this thing. That would go, that away, would go away if there was some kind of official recognition of the uh, role of English. Now, the thing is, I mean, English is the second language. All the work in the NGOs, the banks, the corporate world, the foreign office, everything is done in English, you see. So uh, that brings me in this particular anthology of your published in the streets of Dhaka towards the end you have explained why you write in English and there you have explained that uh, while studying in Anglophone schools and all those beautiful poetries of Wordsworth mm -hmm. and uh, Shelley and everyone but it didn't invoke that uh, imagination of a youngster. Mm -hmm. Because you do not see uh, those flowers or those uh, meadows and grassy lands. It's so far away. So is, was that your inspiration to start writing in English uh, poetry? No. Uh, no, I, I mentioned uh, what happened. I mean, we had a wonderful teacher called Brother Hobart. And um, in school, uh, we had uh, D.H. Lawrence's snake. That really turned me on. I mean, I said, look, I mean, even without meter and rhyme, you can create wonderful poetry. And then I started reading more, you see, free verse. And uh, you, you'll f find that um, most of the post-colonial poets, I think, um, use free verse. Because um, the rhythms of our English are different from the rhythms of someone born in the English home counties, you see. Um, so, well, I, I found that liberating and started um, you know, reading up on you know, images and all that, you see, and uh, scribbling more and more. Let's hear something from you. Oh. If you would just read out something for us. I once thought of um, you know, reading in a blues style. And I wrote a poem called Buriganga Blues. Buriganga is the river on which the city of Dhaka stands. Buriganga Blues. Down, 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 down on my luck in downtown Dhaka. I take my time brushing teeth, shaving with three-month-old throwaway razor. Catch up with headlines waving at me from a newsboy's hand as if I'm an old buddy. Should I wave back at which renewed allegations of corruption or allegations trashed or offer a two-fingered salute in remembrance of Wolf Cup days? V for victory or U for up yours? Which? Or should I part with a part of my dwindling resources on a copy of the rag and open at Mufassal News and predictable samples of perennial problems in small town and countryside? Women sent to Coventry, if not whipped, for alleged adultery? Or found Ardezabil hanging by a ratty sari from bamboo rafters. Power play of local honchos with gangs of goons to straighten out nosy newsmen. It's so easy to shed tears. Are there any use? Can they solve an uneasy spirit? Wondering if any movement can be viable, I decide to move on. Slip feet into sandals with flapping soles. Let them drag me to the black waters of the polluted Buriganga River. Watch the seasons turn. The rains have stopped. 
the blue sky, the blue sky is such a pure blue, is such a pure blue, I can only stare in disbelief. That blue sky here in Delhi, we can't see. It's all yellow, gray. It's mostly like that in Dhaka also. <laughs> really? But, uh, Tell us about Dhaka. But sometimes, I mean, you do see a bit of blue. So that is the kind of scene that I, uh, you know, that inspired this. Talk, talk, us, talk to us, take us through Dhaka. How is your city like? What it was like, what it has become? When I was... Um, born in 1950, it had 300,000 people. You know? In 1971, when the Liberation War bro broke out, it had 700,000 people. Today, it has 16 million. And it's not that... No, is it, it sorry? Yeah, 16 million will be... In terms of region, has it grown? Yeah. A um, it, has, uh, it has become a conurbation. It has expanded, yes. Um, it has expanded naturally because, I mean, uh, where the airport we went to Dhaka once, the where the airport is now, um, in the early 20th century, some uh, sahibs went uh, pig sti sticking nearby. <laughs> See, and uh, one of them wrote an article about this. So all that is gone. And not far from the airport, someone was eaten up by a tiger. <laughs> and there's a memorial um, plaque to him in uh, a memorial in, on the campus, Dhaka University campus. So yes, I mean, uh, if you just stepped out of the city, it used to be sal and swamp and um, all kinds of wild animals no longer there. Bangladesh as a whole is the most densely populated country in the world, you know, and... Uh, Taken over from Japan. Well, Japan was... Uh, I don't understand why Japan is called, was ever called the most densely populated country in the world, because it never matched... Um, I, I think it never matched <laughs> Bangladesh. But there is one thing about Bangladesh uh, traffic. It's, it's chaotic, it's maddening, but like in case of Pakistan, Bangladesh rickshaws are also very well decorated and it's quite something to look there out is, for. And um, it's not as gaudy as it used to be, I mean, because it uh, takes a bit of money to have those. But rickshaw painting is a genre, you know, just a struck art in some parts of uh, the subcontinent in uh, Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Pakistan, North India, there used to be quite a bit of that. So there are, there, there are professional artists who paint these on tin, uh, rectangular tin, and w with plastic paint, um, you know, yeah. And those are sort of uh, attached to the back of the rickshaws, and even the body of the rickshaw is decorated with, um, you know, um, plastic cutouts in different shapes and colors. Um, nowadays, they uh, don't want to spend that much even. So it's, and the number of rickshaws is always going up. Which makes, I mean, uh, except for the main thoroughfares where they are not allowed, I mean, the traffic is just unbelievably chaotic, you know. The reason I brought it out, I'm sure many people over here, whoever knows about Bangladesh, would first thing they would associate with Bangladesh is Hilsa. Mm -hmm. That's the anglicized version, but uh, any Bengali would say Ilish. And then the next thing would be the saris. Yes. The Dhakai Jamdani yeah. saris. But Dhaka or Bangladesh also weaves in its popular culture, popular art, very, uh, very much along with its beautiful uh, entire work. Right? So in, like in your case, in your work, uh, you do not write love poems, love poetries. Your I have a few. See, look at your face. <laughs> So the most of them, they talk about life unreal, they're your inspiration, whatever you see around you, society, the politics. So why? Why not poetry? Why not in indulge in a poetry of love poetry, you know, which is very popular? Okay. 
Let me read out uh, the, my civil service romance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I was, when they started writing, um, I was greatly inspired by Nisi Mizuki, whom you have all read. And uh, at, at that time, he became quite um, uh, notorious for his poems in Indian English. People said, some said, some liked it, liked them, and some said, oh, you know, you are making fun of the way we use English. So I wrote a few. Uh, one of them is different from the kind of thing he did because I use a parody of the kind of uh, language that um, was used in the bureaucracy, you see. And uh, even when we were gro growing up, you know, the uh, model letters that you could find in uh, school uh, books, they used this archaic, you know, uh, idiom. You know, with due respect and humble submission, I beg to state that blah blah blah. You know, so <laughs> so I use that kind of idiom uh, for this uh, uh, love poem, civil service romance. It's dedicated to Nisi Ezekiel. It's in two parts. Part one, the letter. Subject: improvement of bilateral ties. Dear Miss, with due respect and humble submission, I beg to welcome you to neighboring section. I'm coming the other day early for a change in view of new boss. And you are also coming up the same stairway. Power is failing as per schedule. And the lift will not move, not even down. Five floors is no joke for fair sex. But still, you are climbing and smiling. I'm sweating, but you are glowing <laughs> and becoming very beautiful. Hitherto, also, you are pretty needless to say. This is the face I'm saying to myself to expedite launching of vessels. Fair Helen, I'm mentally drafting. Make me immortal crew member. You are joining as lower division assistant but you are upper division lady to me. I was lower division also initially and rose by dint of good performance. I will teach sweet lady to follow suit. I'm thinking at once how to do the buttering of boss without compromising situation, etc. By the grace of Allah, my boss today is sending me with urgent file to your section and we are talking while the matter is pending as per unwritten regulation. What is urgent when we are dealing with most immediate? <laughs> Bosses and governments come and go, but we go on forever. <laughs> we are learning family particulars, likes and dislikes, making jokes, improving all round bilateral ties. Now night is falling and falling. And I am like ever loving film hero, tossing and turning with pillow in lieu of beloved. I cannot find further words, not even in dictionary, so adieu. Please reply most immediate. <laughs> I will die for you every day <laughs> and remain your humble servant. Part two, the reply. Subject, matrimonial. <laughs> Dear sir, with reference to your letter of no date, the matter is referred to father through mother. <laughs> I'm on casual leave, cooking dishes. Please apply through proper channel and thereby oblige your loving servant. <laughs> so, isn't that a love poem? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, let's digress a little bit from here to your translation work okay. and my first question is I can understand you translating Shamshur Rahman the question that I've given you I've, I've spoke, spoken to you about yesterday evening but I I completely fail to understand why would anybody uh, embark upon translating Monusha Mongol of all things it's a complicated thing it is old Bengali why <clears throat> um, like you, I grew up with the story. 
Are you familiar with the snake goddess Manasa? India is Manasa known Devi. for its snakes and snake charmers, okay. uh, especially in the eastern part of India, I would yes, say. Eastern yes. part of India, snake yes. goddess is called uh, Monosha. Monosha. And it's, it's uh, and revered, yes. feared, uh, hated. Yeah. And uh, Manasa's, Manasa's uh, brother, Vasuki, is uh, mentioned the in the Mahabharata, actually, in the Sarpa Satra. You know. So, um, now the, the stories about Manasa, and Manasa is an indigenous goddess. And so there was this uh, conflict between the uh, Aryanizing settlers in ancient times and the indigenous um, cults and goddesses. And there's a rather tragic figure called Chand Saudagar, the merchant, who is a devotee of Shiva and refuses to acknowledge Manasa as a goddess. And so the whole story is about how Manasa sort of tries to sub subdue this man and eventually sort of force him to acknowledge her. And in the process, there are all kinds of things which go on. So it's a story of epic proportions. And it's also a story of the sort of uh, uh, reconciliation of the indigenous and the, uh, the Aryan um, orders, as it were. Um, it's a fascinating story in itself. I wanted to, I thought, well, I mean, it would, as a kind of creative exercise, I could uh, try to write a modern version, mixing prose and verse. But then um, I talked to uh, uh, um, Dr. Sharmila Sen of the Harvard University Press. She heard about this from me, and she said that I'd be interested, but we don't do creative writing. You'd have to justify it as a scholarly work. work. So I sent in a proposal. I looked at all the v available versions I could find. There are literally dozens and dozens, and many that, are s that have still not been um, edited and published, which exist on palm leaf manuscripts. And among and the major ones. It also has got oral versions, right? Even, in fact, even now, the, uh, at the end of Sravana, there's a Manasa festival. And I went to uh, a village not far from Dhaka. And there, they said that there, are, uh, there used to be about 200 folk theater troops who would perform Manasa things. Now there are just over a dozen. And they follow the, uh, bends, of the bend, bends of the river we, because the uh, Behula, you know, she went with the dead body of her husband like that. And they perform rituals and uh, bits of the story, you know. It's, they are sort of dramatized. Uh, they are like musicals, you see, folk musicals. And uh, ev every year, every year at that time. And uh, again, it's very interesting that all the members of that troupe were, uh, uh, were Muslim. And there were even two hajis. <laughs> and, um, it's all it woven into that so-called completely Hindu tale. Right? The Monisha Mongol. Yeah. Within that, the mm. all Muslim characters are also woven into that tale. Mm -hmm. And it's in practice, and yes. they are completely revered right. in a similar right. fashion. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, it, it was fascinating so, to see that I mean, even now it's a sort of living uh, tradition. So, um, it's not that these things have died out. Uh, these, in the cities, we are not aware of a lot of things which are going on in uh, folk culture in the countryside. Um, so I, I became interested and I produced a composite modern prose version. So uh, telling, or retelling all the important episodes, you see, in my own way in prose so that a modern reader can easily get into the book. So, and uh, that um, uh, gave me uh, ideas for more work with these old texts. See, so, I hope uh, I can do two or three more. So, what is more challenging, writing poetry or translation? No, um, po I mean, poetry, uh, you don't know when you will write the next poem, you see? And then there are fallow periods. 
And uh, this is something one can do uh, more systematically, you know, in a more disciplined way. So I think they're both part, I mean, equally important parts of my literary life. You know. So how do you do it? You are translating something, you're, you have taken up a project. Mm -hmm. In between, you also indulge into writing poetry? No, uh, poetry, I mean, when, it, when I... Uh, when a poem comes, as it were, you know, so you, I just write it. Um, and it, poems come in different ways. Some poems come at one go. Some, you get, get an image, you get a phrase, you jot it down, and it's important to write it down, you see. James Joyce used to walk about, he used to have scraps of paper in his pockets. If, he, if a phrase occurred to him, which he thought liked, he would jot it down and put it in his pocket. At the end of the day, he would take all those pieces of paper out and sort them and then put them into a, a big notebook, you see? So, so do you have some scraps of papers along with you right now to jot down your thoughts? Ah, uh -huh, but I, I'm not going to read out anything. <laughs> <laughs> but the poem, the kind of poem that comes at once, I mean, again, you mentioned love poem. Let, I'll, I'll give you an example. Writing home. Uh, it's actually dedicated to my wife. So. Wow. <laughs> it was written at, uh, in Hawthornden Castle, which is a, now a writer's co uh, colony in Scotland, outside Edinburgh. Writing home. On this hundred acre plot that pretends to be paradise, of all birds, I have an ear for doves and crows, whose cooing and cawing is just like at home. I remember the frenzy of rickshaw bells, I shut my eyes and imagine the weight of your head on my chest. So, this came just at one go. And it was a love poem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your lot of, lo, quite a bit part of your life you have spent outside and abroad uh, in US and in UK in doing your scholarly work. So what is it that you missed most when you are outside and you are into a big work like that from home? What is it that you missed really most? Food, uh, people? People, yeah. I mean, and you know, most of the work I've done, the creative work was done at home, you know? Um, when I went abroad for my, to complete my education for my PhD, I did a postdoc on the Fulbright in America. I was in Paris on a residency at Le Recollet. But um, most of these poems, and even the Manasas thing, I did at home. You know? So, and, but what I miss is actually the Dhaka of the past where it was, we had the, in the regular literary addas. And the adda is an institution, it's, I think, dying even in Calcutta, I'm told. Yeah. See? And that beautiful culture. Adda is a very Bengali word. Um, how do I talk? Adda is like talking nonsense for an indefinite period of time and be inspired by it and come back with a creative work. That happens. So, you know, you have musical addas, you have, yes. you have literary yes. addas, and, and you have political addas, and yeah. you have nonsensical addas, everything. Hmm. So, that uh, culture with it dying down, uh, but Dhaka is, Dhaka is going to have a literature festival very soon, like this I week. know, the Can Dhaka Lit Fest. Again, I mean, uh, these literary festivals are very different from th that kind of a uh, uh, literary scene. That is more informal, hmm. you know. Literary festivals have to be um, sponsored by publishers, you know, a lot of people. And uh, it's be literary festivals started becoming important when people started buying less, fewer books. And when it became uh, more, more difficult commercial. to... Yes, when the, the, literary, uh, the literary world, world became more com uh, commercial. And uh, when it became uh, more difficult to access books, I mean, um, you know, nowadays people don't wander into a bookstore and browse, you see. 
because the lifestyle in general of people has changed so, so radically. So uh, anybody who wants to have a question or ask a question, please raise your hand. We would definitely take it. Uh, in between, I have this question for you, which is, do you as a poet find it difficult to find a publisher since you spoke about a commercial part of the literary? Um, no, I haven't found it difficult, but it is difficult, yes. And um, I think uh, um, we were talking about this before we came in. If uh, the publishing industry is changing, and one positive uh, development, I think, is the new technology that uh, produces books on order. So a publisher need not print a thousand copies or 2,000 or 500, whatever, and keep them and hope that people will eventually buy them. With a print-on-order machine, you can have the book, uh, the virtual book in the machine, and if somebody orders 10 copies, you press a button, and yeah. 10 copies will come out. And then you can send them to the person who has ordered them. So that, and with along with um, you know internet internet sales, I think that is one way out for literary publishing, and these this kind of uh, edition in the print on order edition has become the the norm with uh, poetry in the West. Most of the small ha presses that publish poetry use this technology, because then they don't have to you know. Um, spend a lot of spend money. Spend a lo lot of money in And the book will never go out of print. If somebody orders it, they'll just uh, you know, send, send those copies, the, the number of copies which have been ordered. We have a question. As a, as a poet, um, poems don't have language as such. But as a poet, do you think in Bengali first and then translate it into English in your mind? Or do you think in English? No, uh, I mean, as I said, I mean, English is my literary language, so and um, uh, from kindergarten onwards, my education was entirely in English. Um, it, it's only in class five that um, we had Bangla as a uh, Bangla language, uh, and that. Um, but uh, at home, I was my parents taught me Bangla using you know the standard uh, bazaar. Um, Textbooks, you know. Born a puri choya. Born, yeah, adoshuli pi and whatnot. <laughs> so, um, when I wrote anything, it was always in English. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I think yes. I mean, it, well, thinking is a very strange thing because you don't always think with words. I mean, there is something that has been called mentalese. You know, there's a thought, and there is mentalese, uh, it can be proved because every time you say something and you say, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant, what I mean is this. It means that there's this thought, which is pre-linguistic, and then you utter something and you say, oh, no, let me. You communicate in a language. Yeah, and then you turn, uh, rephrase what you want to say, you see? So, but um, the basic, the language in my head the primary language is English. At the same time, I think today, um, whatever language one expresses oneself in, one, everybody is multilingual. Because there are so many languages, you know, which mm. are bombarding our consciousness, you know. So, um, people, even young pe uh, children in Bangladesh are picking up a bit of Hindi from the Bollywood movies, you know. Um, so a cousin of mine said, um, you know, his son, very small, he said, you know, he told me, he said, my son said to me the other day, uh, in, in a mixture of Bangla and Hindi, Baba, barish hoche, barish hoche, you see? Which means, so, Baba, it's raining. It's raining, so barish hora. So barish mixed with the Bangla word, <laughs> you see? So this kind of, um, you know, code mixture, is, has become the norm in many, many societies. And then even in the written Bangla, I mean, even in, uh, uh, in the Sharodio um, uh, the Desh or something, 
Uh, the really Durga Puja versions of literary magazines yes. uh, published from Calcutta, uh, Kolkata. And a novel by a very highly respected veteran novelist, Shishan the first In the first paragraph, one third of the words were English. So it, it's in Bangla, Bangla script. But when people speak, they use a, mix a lot of Bangla, uh, it's all English Pichri words. Language. Yeah, so, you know. The fiction, I think, you know, uh, reflects the. I think it's also because of the popular culture. It's like everyone nowadays speaks in mingling with different words. We had another question from the back. A very good afternoon, sir. Uh, we just heard a love poem of yours. My point was whenever I see a romantic poet or a romantic poem, that's very really different. But yours was much of a humorous and hilarious one. Why is it so and why are your love stories different from the other poets? I, I, I love humor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you actually love humor. I saw that with the two parts of the script. Uh, but I say, does love actually require some humor? Because when I do humor, I actually face the reverse consequences. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the humor strengthens whatever you want to say. <laughs> I really do. And so I, I think you should not be put off by b b what uh, some you know uh, sour pusses <laughs> you know, say. Maybe you should <laughs> maybe you should start writing poetry. <laughs> that might help you. Uh, that brings me to my last question of the session, which is, uh, what is going to be our, your next work? What are you working on? Uh, now, besides the. Poetry, which comes in dribs and drabs, yes. There are two folk uh, texts um, which I want to retell. In, uh, in, uh, I, I call it interpretative retelling, so that in retelling in modern prose, I can also in mix it with whatever interpretation mm -hmm. is necessary for the modern reader. The uh, Mormon Shingho Gitika, which is a collection of uh, Bengali folk tales mm -hmm. um, uh, put together in the 1930s by Dinesh Chandra Shin. That one, and a uh, biography of Prophet Muhammad by a Sufi, where, which is very interesting, where he writes all about Vishnu also. Where a, Prophet Muhammad is... Uh, so, uh, sketched upon like Vishnu avatar? Uh, Vishnu is also a, like a prophet. So, I mean, there, there's an in, in, interesting sort of syncretism. Intermingling of it. Yes, which I find fascinating. And that the writer, this was published, this was written in the late 16th century. And the writer, Said Sultan, is um, revered as a peer. I mean, his darga is still there in Chittagong and people go and do the, you know, the usual rituals. Uh, Very every, popular. Uh, every, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, and if, I, if these two work, I'll have a crack at Kashiram Dash's Mahabharat. Oh. <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> let's hope so. Let's hope, so the, let's hope to get you back one more time sometimes later, once you are done Thank with Thank you so it. much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this audience.